Advised. It's on in the Motor City. It's Detroit. Big D. If you're not prepared for it, it will hurt you. And one gang has declared war. If you don't respect me, I will take my respect out of your ass. It's either kill or be killed. It's the nature of the game. They'll violate anybody that they see fit. They're the devil's disciples. You don't want to cross them. They're prepared to do what it takes to protect their interests. You consider me dangerous? Answer me. Do you consider me dangerous? I'm very dangerous. Detroit, Michigan. This is the city that the auto industry built. Growing up in the city of Detroit, most everything is influenced by the car industry. Either you worked Ford, GM, or Chrysler, or you worked for a company that was a supplier. But as the car business has faded, the Motor City has earned a new reputation for violence. You can't be a fake mother to live in Detroit. You gotta be real. Detroit, that city will eat you up. And one gang is striving to rule this city. The Devil's Disciples. Lifestyle is fast and furious, baby. Ben Diesel ain't got on us. Let's go, go, go. Handy your business. Their sole purpose is to make money. The Devil's Disciples, they manufacture, distribute, and traffic in methamphetamine. The gang also moves marijuana and cocaine. But dealing drugs isn't their only vice. They're also involved in prostitution, murder for hire, extortion, involved in trafficking of weapons and explosives. These gangsters reject society's laws. This renegade image even extends to their name. They spell disciples without the S to distance themselves from religion. D-I-C-I-P-L-E-S. That's disciples. If you get asked too many times, you punch them in the head. The Devil's Disciples have around 250 members across the country. But their headquarters are in Michigan. The Devil's Disciples, they tend to like to fly under the radar of law enforcement. They keep their overall club numbers to a minimum, which in the long run makes it easier to control politically. Secrecy defines the gang. Very little is known about their dealings, except their most important rule, say nothing. If you're a patch holder, you know things about that club that non-patch holders will never know. You're supposed to die with them secrets. 43-year-old Billy Smith, AKA Billy Wad, joined the Devil's Disciples in 2000. And he's the only disciple willing to talk about the gang. He's always paranoid. He's out the feds. Who's following me? That's the life I chose, that's the life I led. Billy Wad grew up in a middle-class neighborhood in Detroit. But at age 15, he moved to Brightmoor, a neighborhood with one of the worst crime rates in the D. What you see in Brightmore is drugs, prostitution. You see the world. You see a whole different world from what you're accustomed to. A lot of people don't want to come to that area. Every other house was burned down. Billy says he did what he had to. You adapt to your environment, and that's what I did. I probably started dealing drugs at 15, maybe 16 years of old. Billy's driving ambition was to get rich. Before long, he was building a profitable business, 
and the reputation. Philly was a decent sized trafficker. He was associated with some pretty violent individuals. I took the dope game to a different level. Most white people, they're gonna do drugs. That wasn't me. I was here making money like the homeboys. That's why I got the respect I did. That's also how he earned his nickname, Billy Wad. Wad came from, because he was always carrying around wads of cash. And he'd have pocket full of $100 bills. We had cars from morning to night driving down that block 24 7. We had some 10s, we had some 20s. You know, and cats like me, I had workers out there. I got boat as big as your shoulders. I was probably selling four to five keys a week. I'm seeing $28,000 per key of cocaine. You see cocaine, I see money. Billy's notoriety as a dealer drew the attention of the notorious Devil's Disciples. And they believed in me. They knew what they were getting. They were getting a real serious individual. They weren't getting your average probate. Billy's drug business was a windfall for the Devil's Disciples, who take a cut of everything. It's almost like an organized crime family, a mafia family. To what extent, I'm not sure. But money does make its way up the organizational chain. You could see who was doing what, who was watching what. They ran their business right. 36-year-old Marjorie Smith was Billy's wife when he joined the gang. I'm bullheaded. I was one hardcore bitch. If there's a fist fight, everyone's fighting. Women, men, whoever. Everyone's fighting. One night, Marjorie, Billy, and some other disciples were out partying when they walked into a bar where a wake was being held. And someone at the bar got rude, mad that we were invading their wake. And next thing I knew, their fists were flying. Marjorie did what any devil's disciple is expected to do. One thing I could do is grab a pool stick. And you know, I was just cracking whoever I could reach. The devil's disciple's vow of secrecy is absolute. Talking to law enforcement is punishable by death. The Devil's Disciples are very, very quiet. They're a nefarious organization. They work uh, on the sly, and, and they've become very, very skilled at what they do. They have rules that you're supposed to live by. It's what we have written for Devil's Disciples. You don't break these. Billy and Marjorie lived by the rules until a heinous crime changed everything. December 22nd, 2002. It was the morning after a holiday party. Billy and Marjorie were still in bed when their nephew, John Wolfenbarger, who wasn't a disciple, stopped by. John had recently been paroled after doing time for breaking and entering. When he went to the joint, he was breaking into houses. That's what he did for a living. John sent Billy's son to wake him up. And then my son came into our room, was like, John's at the door. He needs to talk to you. I'm sleeping. Psh, tell them to see me later. John insisted. I was like, what up? And he came like two inches from me and was like, five's dead. What? He was like, five's dead. John then asked his uncle for a change of clothes. Wasn't really sure what it was about. Back, he said he wanted some clothes and some shoes and, and things like that. And I was like, okay. Billy, who was barely awake, directed John out the door. So I'm laying in bed. My wife's out like a light. 
And I'm thinking, what the he did? He did something to my club brother? No, I'm thinking he's full of shit. he's penitentiary. He ain't telling me the truth. But John's words, Five's dad, still nagged at Billy when he woke up. Billy went looking for his nephew and found him with former cellmate, Dennis Lincoln. I goes down there, sure enough, John and Lincoln's in the house and there's a gun in the kitchen sink. There's jury everywhere, just lined up all through the kitchen. So I'm looking like, mm-hmm, what up? And he was like, dude, um, we did this, that, and the other. What you mean you did this, that, and the other? We robbed this jury man. We killed some people. John asked his uncle if he could help him fence the jewelry. I'm just like, heart, the f And he was like, dude, I got a Rolex right here. You want it? I'm like, no, nah, dude, um, let me get back with you. What Billy soon learned about the crime was sickening. I'd been doing uh, detective work for 15 years, and I've seen a number of homicides, and uh, nothing really shook me quite like this. Billy had a decision to make, violate the disciples' code, or get caught up in a murder. I don't know how anyone could set out waking up in the morning and be like, I'm about to kill these kids. You don't set out and do that, man. You a sick m Detroit, Michigan. This city is famous as the birthplace of the muscle car. But one motorcycle gang is trying to change all that. And they're always prepared for trouble. I can put a cap in your dome. Give me a reason not to. A veil of secrecy has surrounded the Devil's Disciples since its inception. No one can agree on where they were founded, but it's believed they started in 1967, when 12 bikers came together in Southern California. They wanted one thing, to be outlaws. They were misfits. They didn't fit into the norm of society. Many were Vietnam veterans. They didn't want to conform to mainstream America. Early in the gang's history, a power struggle ensued in their Southern California chapter. And one of the leaders was kicked out. But he refused to leave the club and without permission, formed his own Devil's Disciples chapters across the country. There was two devil disciples out there, and they knew about each other, but they never met each other. The two factions built violent reputations on both sides of the country. Boston, Massachusetts, 1969. Six devil's disciples were arrested for assaulting a drug enforcement agent. Phoenix, Arizona, that same year. An Air Force sergeant was shot in the head and dumped in a mine shaft, leading authorities to question a high-ranking Devil's Disciples member. Crescent City, California, 1970. Five disciples were arrested in the firebombing of a deputy sheriff's car. It's either kill or be killed. I mean, it's it's the nature of the game. It's really the battle of the fittest out there. Stabs, gunshots, a lot of ways people can die. In 1973, the Devil's Disciples took it even further. The Devil's Disciples had a large party up in uh, Flint, Michigan. They invited another Detroit motorcycle gang that called themselves the Flying Wheels. These two groups had a dispute, and when it was all over, at least four people died. Then, in 1977, it all changed. The disciples decided they were stronger as one gang than they ever would be as two. There was two totally separate clubs. So they decided to meet. There was going to be one club. 
the meeting occurred in Yuma, Arizona. They chose, why don't we like each other instead of killing each other? This is our patch, this is your patch. Let's intertwine these patches and become one. What was very, very important strategically, drawing together the East and West was, was a big accomplishment, which made them a force to be reckoned with. Now one gang, the devil's disciples became disciplined at keeping a low profile. All while battling other biker gangs, like the Hells Angels and the Outlaws. They're a little more sophisticated, a little more organized. They're in it for the long haul, to make money steadily over a period of time. In the mid-1980s, the gang moved its headquarters to Michigan where members quietly built a criminal network selling crystal meth. Then they made a major mistake. South Bend, Indiana, 1995. After nine years of riding with the devil's disciples, William Bausch, AKA Wild Bill, was booted from the gang. According to club rules, this meant Bausch must forfeit his bike to the disciples. Well, you get a bike, that's club bike. When you decide to leave us, you drop that title off at my office. You leave that title on the table and you leave. But Wild Bill wasn't having it. The club's warlord, Thomas Double T Thacker, went to take back the bike. It got very heated in that discussion, and William Bausch and Thomas Thacker actually pulled guns on one another, with Thomas Thacker giving a warning to William Bausch that he had 24 hours to return the motorcycle. Bausch ignored the order. So the gang came back with numbers. This time, Larry Lee Morgan, AKA Clyde, went with Thacker to take care of business. In the early morning hours of October 22nd, the disciples broke into Wild Bill's house. Bausch was shot and killed by Larry Lee Morgan. He was shot four times in the head and once in the side. Larry Lee Morgan wanted to celebrate. He and Thacker grabbed a gang prospect to drive them and headed to a party in Wolf Lake, Indiana, 80 miles west. Less than an hour into the drive, Morgan suddenly shot Thacker in the head eliminating his accomplice. He let the prospect live only because he didn't know how to get home. The prospect tells us that he now is just completely shaken up because blood is pouring out of Thomas Thacker like someone turned on a garden hose and it's spraying all over him as he's driving. They dumped the body and headed back. The next day, the prospect confessed everything to the cops, violating gang policy. Larry Lee Morgan was arrested and convicted of double homicide. I actually got on the elevator with him at the courthouse and said, OK, now, Larry, it's all done. Tell me why. Why did this happen? Why did you do this? And he looked at me dead in the eye and said, it's just business. The gang went on lockdown and began enforcing its law of secrecy even more aggressively. By 2000, they had about 60 patched members in Michigan alone. The bigger the club, the more issues that pop up. Here in Michigan, they're not as noticeable as some of the other clubs. Billy Wad admired the secrecy when he joined the Disciples. With the profits from his drug dealing operation, 
he rose quickly through the ranks and was made president of their West Side chapter. They knew I was God in the West Side. They knew I could give them something they could not have with the people they were trying to have it with. They could not have a clubhouse on the West Side unless they got me. Marjorie struggled to accept their new life. It was difficult because there's definitely no structure to your life. There's no schedule. There was never a, a family vacation. It was a, we're going on a run here. You know, we're gonna stay here. There was no normal life. The sacrifices were worth it to Billy. Then, a horrifying massacre turned everything upside down. I was boss of the Devil Disciples when the murders occurred. It changed the rest of my life. Detroit. The Motor City. The Devil's Disciples have quietly built a violent motorcycle gang here based on one simple desire. Ride free and not be with. Life is a party. We're here to have a good time. We're going to live the way we want to live without any rules from the government or anyone else for that matter. The Disciples play by only one set of rules. Their own. I live by the bylaws. I have to have a Harley Davidson. I have to think of my brother's welfare first, above myself. I think of my patch first. The patch is sacred to its members. You don't think for yourself when you're a patch holder. You think club first. That means no one, including family, comes before them. They come to your house when they want, they leave when they want. I don't know how many times I'd be cooking food and four of them would walk in. I gotta make more food. The patch is red, white, and blue, and filled with symbolism. If you look in the center, you will see that there is the wheel with the 12 spokes the 12 original members of the Devil's Disciples. After one of them spokes are broke, whether it's through death or through whatever, there's another individual who can step in and be a spoke in that wheel. In the center of that, there's the crossed pitchforks. The two pitchforks stand for power. Our strengths are in twos. If you have two Devil's Disciples, you have power. You can call one person a liar. You ain't gonna call two people a liar. There's also a patch with the letters FTW. F period, T period, W period, uh, which stands for <laughs> the world. It can also stand for forever, together, wherever. The Devil's Disciples don't wear traditional 1% patches like most biker gangs. Devil Disciples are not 1%. Within the Devil Disciples, we claim we're the 1% of the 1%. Do we wear a 1% patch? Absolutely not. The gang's patch is so important that the day a new member is initiated is considered the first day of his life. When you earn that, it's happy birthday. You're a devil disciple. We consider that was the day you were born because you became a devil disciple. All the other years in your life means nothing. The only thing as important to a disciple as their patch is their bike. I can be in the worst mood in the entire world. My old lady can piss me the f off when I want to boot her straight in her mouth. I can get on my bike and ride 100 miles and never, ever think about that. The disciples take the biker life seriously and are famous for their tight, dangerous riding style. Six inches apart. My bike is in front of yours. That next bike in back of me is six inches from my rear wheel. No club ever rides as good as Devil Disciples. We're pretty serious. 
the Devil's Disciples are also serious about their gang hierarchy. Their state chapters are highly structured from the top on down. Chapter President, Chapter VP, Chapter Treasurer, Chapter Secretary, Road Captain, Bar Captain. Bar Captain takes care of the bar. They make sure the bar is stocked up. They make sure we don't run out of The gang's national officers oversee the entire club. National officers oversee states. They oversee the country. As far as an organization, they're extremely good. The Devil's Disciples demand total allegiance. New recruits, called prospects, are hazed without mercy. Once you decide to prospect me, I'll get any thing I want from you. If you don't give it, I'll take it from you. Because you put my, my on your back, I will go to your house and take everything you own, and there's nothing you can do about it. I will take your woman if I choose to and sell that bitch. The gang doesn't give respect to women. A woman that stays at home and isn't allowed around the clubhouse is referred to as a house mouse. You're allowed your house mouse. House mouse takes care of your kids. House mouse takes care of your laundry. I'll come home, where's my food? In addition to their house mouse, members are allowed a certain number of girlfriends. Now, you allow three different bitches. You allow two that no one can touch. The third one, you can claim, but other people can go after that. The women at the bottom of the hierarchy and subject to the most abuse are expected to earn for the gang. That they'll put in strip clubs or on a corner and they'll make them work and they'll take their money. And they'd never let anything happen to them. That's their meal ticket. But when they're done with you, they're done with you. We'll pimp your punk ass out. You know, you'll make that money one way or the other. Members also have their old ladies a wife or girlfriend who hangs around the club. If old ladies prove themselves trustworthy, they'll earn marginal respect. An old lady, the stand-up ones, the ones that have the sense, you know, if something happens, she's the one that's gonna put the gun in her purse. My woman has took my smoking gun out of my in pocket many times and put it in her purse and said, I'll see you, I got this. But women are never more than second-class citizens. Marjorie Smith wanted to learn to ride a bike, but never got the chance. I wanted to, but um, that was just one of them things where club brother needs it more than the old lady does. You, know, you got the bitch pad for the old lady. The disciples' strict code of secrecy has helped them avoid detection by law enforcement. Billy Watt dealt cocaine for more than 15 years and never did major prison time. If you treat it like a game, the game will hurt you. Treat it like a business, you'd be a successful businessman. You, know, you just get used to it, You're getting kilos and a lot of drugs, you know, a lot of money. It just becomes a natural part of life. In addition to dealing, Billy used meth. You do a little blast of meth, it's like taking a shotgun right to the back of your goddamn head. You just, you feel it from your nose to your eyes to the back of your head. And at that point, now you up four or five days. The devil's disciples won't hesitate to be violent. You know, my guns got used when they needed to be used. Did I shoot at anybody? Psh, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. If I felt threatened, I handled my business. Members who are making trouble for the gang are dealt with ruthlessly. One method is called a hot pack. You give drugs to an individual, it's a hot pack. Whether it's meth, cocaine, whatever they choose, their coffee of choice. You put a little something in that pack, whether it's Ajax, whatever is whatever, blow their damn heart up. You got individuals out there 
They need to go. Enough's enough. You hop hack them. The Devil's Disciples even try to profit from members' deaths. The Devil's Disciples specifically require their club members to uh, take out a $10,000 insurance policy and put it in the name of a, a brother, another biker, as a death benefit. For decades, the gang's rules and practices have kept them out of the limelight while keeping them rich. Billy Wad obeyed every rule until a grisly crime put him between the devils and prison. I had no idea that it was gonna change the way it did, unfold the way it did. I had love, sweat, and tears with this club. No matter how tough of a criminal you are, people draw the line at kids. It really, really bothered him. Detroit, Michigan, December 23rd, 2002. John Wolfenbarger, the nephew of Devil's Disciples leader Billy Wad, was bragging that he'd killed five people in a robbery. And he was like, dude, do you have March TV? Hey, haven't seen the thing yet, John, what up? And boom, the murders came up. The Voney family slaughtered, killed this, and the other, he looked at me, winked at me. Dude, we were kids. I looked, the f He was like, yup. Finally, Billy understood exactly what his nephew had done. John had broken into the home of a jewelry store owner named Marco Pesci. John's former cellmate, Dennis Lincoln, waited nearby in a car. The only one home was the grandmother, Maria Vergati. John killed her and waited. The three young Pesci children arrived next. When they came inside, John held a gun to one of their heads and forced them to make a call. Mr. Pesci received a phone call from one of the children uh, stating that one of the other kids had hurt herself and he needed to get home right away. So he dropped what he was doing, uh, got in his vehicle, and drove home. When Pesci rushed in, Wolfenbarger forced him to open a safe hidden in the basement. John then murdered everyone in the house, including 12-year-old Carlo, 9-year-old Sabrina, and 6-year-old Melissa. They were found lying face down with bullets in their backs. You con that man into coming home. You cold-blooded m So what you do? You kill all of them. Johnny was smirking. John was proud of it. He was expecting like a thumbs up or something, like a pat on the back. It was the way, I mean, he was, it was just like a notch in his belt, I guess. The crime was horrendous and Billy Wad knew he had to violate the disciples' code of silence. He called a narcotics officer who had arrested him once before. I know a lot of cops. Every biker knows a lot of cops. This particular cop I knew and I trusted. That's why I called him. It was like, dude, check this out for me. He was very nervous and he told us that he had information on a family of five that had been murdered in the city of Livonia. The officer had seen the news reports. And he was like, yeah, it's for real. Why, you ain't like that. He killed kids, the come in. I can't come in, you know who I am. He was appalled by the fact that three small children were executed but he was still struggling with the fact that he knew it was against his code to speak to law enforcement. Finally, Billy Wad agreed to meet with the Livonia police. My impression was he was concerned about being there. Um, he didn't like being in the police department, that's for sure. He wasn't painting the whole picture. It was giving 
bits and pieces. Slowly, investigators pulled more information out of Billy. We needed to question him at length and um, gather as much information as we possibly could, and we needed to get that information under oath. The next day, they decided to stage Billy's arrest so the devil's disciples wouldn't suspect that he was cooperating. The arrest was in order for Billy to have a reason to be with the police for an extended period of time. He was very concerned that club members would find out that he was talking with the police. But the disciples did find out and paid a visit to Billy's house. They wanted any association with the DDs out of that house. They needed everything. They wanted patch and, and, and T-shirts and just, I mean, the, the stupidest little stuff. They just wanted anything that, that dealt with the DDs. Billy's predicament got worse when the cops asked him to testify. At that point, it was like, well, you got to get on the stand. What do you mean, get on the stand? You know who the f I am. I'm a devil disciple. Devil disciples don't get on the stand. Reluctantly, Billy agreed and took the stand against his nephew in open court. I was on stand for like two, three days. Everyone in Michigan knew I was there. Everyone in this country knew I was there. You're only nervous if you got something to hide. I ain't nervous. I had nothing to hide. The jury believed his testimony. John Wolfenbarger and his accomplice, Dennis Lincoln, were both convicted of murder and sentenced to life. He definitely helped uh, with the investigation and help solve this murder. His information was responsible for our ability to act so quickly and uh, take Mr. Wolfenbarger off the street before he could do anything else to anyone else. The Devil's disciples claim to support Billy's decision, but Billy says they were saying one thing while planning something else. They said, no, we back you 100%. 100% you got that monster off the street. It's not how it was, though. One night, months after the trial, someone shot at Billy. They'd also tampered with his bike, and he almost crashed on the way home. That's where I actually started getting scared. Then I had an individual from another club come to me and like, you know they got a hit on you. What you mean they got a hit on me? You know they got a hit on you. What you did, the devil disciples put a hit on me for standing up in open court and testifying against him because it's not allowed. Detroit, Michigan, the 313. The devil's disciples motorcycle gang has thrived by doing their crime with the least amount of exposure. If somebody steals from them, they don't need to call the police, they'll take care of it themselves. If somebody hurts somebody that they shouldn't hurt, they'll hurt that person. That's how these organizations operate. In 2002, Detroit chapter boss Billy Wad ignored club rules and told the cops that his nephew had massacred an entire family. I've had individuals who asked me, Billy Wad, Knowing who you are, why didn't you handle that in a different way? Why didn't you take care of that in your way? The only answer I could give was a truthful one. You know how I felt my heart. I did what I feel I had to do. I don't think you call him a hero. I think you call him somebody that did wrong, that finally did right. That's what I call him. Maybe Billy atoned for some of his sins that he's committed by doing the right thing here. The disciples claim to support Billy's decision, but Billy and his wife Marjorie insist the gang try to kill them. They knew that if they came to our doorstep that someone wasn't walking away. And then it was on. At that point in time, it was on, because we were done. I sat back and watched things occur. To me and my family, it was like, mm-hmm. Okay, so this is how it's gonna be, huh? 
After everything I've done, everything I've been through, this is how you cats are gonna treat me, huh? Billy Wad's decision to cooperate with police seemed to open a door. The devil's disciples had kept close for nearly four decades. The DDs, they like to consider themselves a, a closed organization. But in the other aspect of society, it's hard to keep a secret. In March 2005, the gang's number came up. The FBI and the Michigan State Police formed a joint task force and went after the Devil's Disciples. The cops raided and shut down two meth labs. Then, in April 2009, the gang's national boss, Jeff Fat Dog Garvin Smith, and 17 other members were arrested on charges including drug trafficking and unlawful possession of body armor. Billy Watt says the gang has grown careless. Bikers make the feds' jobs easy. They can sit there and say, F the feds. They're this, they're bullshit. they're liars. They make it up. When it all comes down to it, do they have a case? The disciples have once again gone underground. I believe that their thinking is, is that if they're low on the radar, it doesn't draw public attention, media attention, or police attention to their business. These groups tend to circle the wagon, so to speak, uh, circle their resources, and they will probably rebound better than they were before. They'll stick to the plan that has worked for decades staying small and tight-lipped. I think any club could go out and get bigger numbers, but bigger isn't always better. Is there more money to be made with more members? There is, but with more members comes more problems. So I think they're comfortable where they're at right now. Billy Wad is no longer an active member of the Devil's Disciples. After the trial, he and Marjorie left Detroit. I'd have been a devil disciple to this day if that wouldn't occur. I didn't turn my back on them. They turned their back on me. That's exactly what happened. Though Billy says there's still a price on his head, he lives in the open. I ain't hiding a damn thing. I, wasn't, I ain't ashamed of what I did. I still ain't ashamed to this day what I did. The trial took its toll on Billy's marriage. He and Marjorie are now separated. But she has found it hard to start over. It was rough, not knowing anybody, trying to, to get from here to there. And it's kind of hard, because everyone asks, well, why are you here? And some people know. Some people know of, of what we left behind. Billy Wad says he's now trying to live a straight life. But in his heart, he'd rather be riding with the devil's disciples. Do I like my life? Billy Wise a nine to fiver. Billy Wise an 11 hour a day person. Billy Wise can't stand this.